gives you an idea. Thank you. I got it. Okay, well, let's get started then. Um, I was going to give Lori, since she asked the question or made the statement last time that she finally figured out that they were actually having laws created prior to Mount Sinai. I wanted to give her an understanding that besides 12.1, if she would look at 12.14, they established Pesach as a annual remembrance. And if she would go to 13.9 to 16, she would find out that they established phylactery or, or teflim. And that was also a, a new law that was going to go into effect. And also the idea of the firstborn belonging to God, that was 13.11. So those were all prior to now in this next batch we're going to find out that they they also covered the idea of the ashes of the red heifer were actually spoken prior to this point the establishment of the laws of relationships were also going to be going on so that we would see this again in the following year when we went through the uh the 50 days of counting the accounting of the omer and they also established sabbath as a recognized day all during this portion so there was lots of laws that had already been given prior to prior to mount sinai mount sinai we 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 get the understanding of the uh, the 10 basics but actually much of it has already been given and much of it would be added to as we went along so i wanted to give that shout out to begin with now, I want you to go back to, if you will, back to uh, Exodus, and let's go to the first chapter, or the 13th chapter, I guess it is, 17th verse, because that's where our Beshlach starts. And, you know, when, when you talk about Shlach, because there's several Parshas that deal with Shlach, the idea of going out or coming in. And so, in this particular case, they were sent out. He sent them out. And so that's what we're going through in Beshlach. As we as we look at this, I want you to, to see, well, what I thought was rather fascinating, and that's in the very beginning when it says, and it happened when Pharaoh sent out the people, Hayom, Hayam, that God did not lead them by way of the land of the Philistines because it was near, for God said, Perhaps the people, Ha'am, will reconsider when they see the see a war. Now, the idea of seeing a war was that, that earlier, several thousand of the tribe of, uh, oh, shoot, Ephraim attempted to go back to Israel early. And in doing so, they went through Philistia, and Philistians slaughtered some hundred thousand of the of these early Ephraimites trying to go um. So he didn't want them to see the casualty count in there. And they will return to Egypt. So God turned the people, Ha'am, toward the way of the wilderness to the Sea of Reeds. Now, you look at the very next verse very beginning says the children of Israel. So why does he spend time talking about the people, Ha'am, and then turn around and talk about B'nai Yisrael? What, what am I supposed to understand? And so I tried to get a clarification from, from Rabbi, and, and I think I understood in his roundabout way that what we're talking about here in these people is the, are the people that would be the Goyim, the Gentiles, the Arev Rav, all of those other people who also would go out with Moshe and the children of Israel. All of them would leave together. And so when he was taking them out, he did not want to lead the people, the whole group, all the way up to the Philistians. But if you go and look at the roadmap, that they took as they left Pharaoh and they started out. You'll find that their first moves were towards the north, exactly towards Felicia, and all of a sudden God turns them around and brings them back down south. So was the 
conversation had after Moses started leading? That's part of the question that I still have that I haven't got an answer to. But we begin to see that there's this, this process that's going on. Now, as we go through the text, we have to notice, first off, the children of Israel were armed when they went up from the land of Egypt. Where did they get their arms? They didn't really have them until after Pharaoh's army was destroyed. Now, I take that from this point. One of the uh, Midrashic writings talks about the fact that the that they not only harvested the weapons because the bodies of the Egyptian soldiers floated to the surface. Now, you and I both know that in a normal drowning, a person will stay submerged for quite a while until he begins to bloat, and that's when you, he surfaces again. Well, these people wouldn't have had that much time, but yet for the Jews so that they understood that Israel that Egypt's army had drowned God floated their bodies back up to the surface now remember some of them are wearing heavy weapons they're carrying swords they're carrying their spears those kinds of things because yes they took all the money and the valuables from the Egyptians before they came out but they didn't take the weapons and so now all of a sudden God says oh here Here's some weapons for you as you leave. And so now they have the weapons, they have the financials, all of those things are going to be there. But it begins by talking about the fact that they were armed. And when they went up from the land of Egypt, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Now, the idea of the bones is very important. We know that he was according to the Egyptian system, that he was mummified. But when it uses the word bones, it's using the word which means essence. So they were taking up the essence of him. In the story of, uh, of Elisha, after he passes away, his body is in the, in the ground, and there was a battle going on, and they wanted, the, the people were trying to bury a man. And so they threw him into the hole or into the ground where his body touched the essence, the bones of Elisha. So one of the things that we, you, I guess I gained from that or gleaned from that is the fact that it's a, the bones, it's the skeleton that actually contains an essence of who we are. And that essence is there until where the bones are no longer there. So there's a, a part of us, remember, as the soul is multiple portions, that essence, that last bit of us is still found there. And that's the concept behind the loose bone that they have, that they say that that's the only bone that never disintegrates, never goes away. So our essence has always been in the ground, waiting for a chance to return. So anyway, it says, so Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he had firmly adjured the children of Israel, saying, God will surely remember you, and you shall bring my bones, bring up my bones from here with you. And so Moses had gone through the process of bringing up the bones. I want you to remember where the bones had been kept. Remember, it was in a chest that was actually found in the Nile River itself. That Moses had been led there by one of uh, Jacob's granddaughters. And so as he brings up the chest, he brings it up and takes it with him. And that piece of equipment is going to become important later on. But for right now, my, I want us to understand that he's bringing this chest with him from the ground to put it back into the ground, just as Jacob's body was put into the ground. Joseph's body would be taken to Shechem. Shechem was the place where he would be buried. Today, that's the city of Nablus, or actually it's just down the hill from Nablus. That's where it was actually at. And so there was a purpose that was going on there. Now, going on to the next verse, there are so many things I wanna tell you. I wanna to talk to you about the water the water that Joseph was in, 
the water of the Red Sea, the water of Mara, the water of Rephaim. Water is a significant thing. In fact, maybe I should just start talking to you about it now because it's, it's definitely burning in me. The concepts, one of the things that I've really, really found myself buried in is Genesis chapter one. It's the seed plot, yes, but it's also a series of metaphors. It's also a hidden message that's found there. And one of the things that I understand is that water represents, obviously, metaphorically, Torah. Torah is water. It, it, it is the substance that we really require. We require food. We require a bread in order to survive. But Torah, Amos 3, tells us that there's going to come a time when there will be this famine. No water, no food. The famine was the famine of the word, of Torah. That's the famine. So from the very beginning, God has left us keys and marks. And one of those marks is the water. Water identifies, first off, the idea that, well, let's go to the, let's jump ahead. I haven't got there, but let's jump ahead to the water at the Red Sea. Now, in the water at the Red Sea, remember, it says that the sea parted. And as the sea parted, that the people went through or into the water. I want you to take that same image, and I want you to go all the way back to Genesis chapter 1 and the second day. Remember, the first day was a day of light and dark. But it was the second day where there was darkness upon the waters. And there was a splitting of the waters, some above, some below, just like the wall of water that was surrounding the people. Because remember, if you, if you look at the symbol, Aleph, Aleph is supposed to remind us of this very event in Genesis 1, because there is a Yud above, a Yud below, and in between is a Vav. The Vav represents a firmament, a dividing between the two waters. The same thing happens as the Jews will go through the water. They divide the two waters. Now, if you remember the story, the Jews, that the, the two waters, the water below wanted to be with the water above. He wanted to know that he was in contact with Hashem, God. But he was divided from him. Now, if Torah is, is what our metaphor is about, then we have to find the fact that the Torah, there is a Torah above and a Torah below. In other words, there is a physical Torah, a literal Torah, that that's what we read. But there's also a higher Torah, a Torah that's above the water, that are, that's above the line. And that's the Torah that you, I, all of us are seeking to get above that line. Yes, we can, we can read the text, and it's a very wonderful text, but at the same point in time, what's above it? What are, what are we missing in our stories? What are we not understanding? And so that's the, the focus, I guess, I have of water at this point as it deals with the Torah. So the water is, is about the, those two things. So it also would tell us about left and right. It also tells us about inner and outer. There are two dimensions of, of this whole thing. The first dimension is just legal. That's the bottom. That's the level that we normally live in. We spend our time learning the Musar. We learn the laws. We learn, basically, we learn the seven laws and all the applications of those. For the Jew, they learn the 613, and they have a greater number of, of laws to have to learn and to identify and to understand. But what's above that? What's up here? In other words, how do these laws down here apply to what's above? And so the Jews are now going to go through that water. Now, when they come out the other side, one of the things that we're going to learn is they both sing songs. The men sing in one place, the women sing in another place. I found it fascinating when I stopped to realize 
Miriam's group brought flutes and they brought tambourines and they brought drums, things to musically ex to excite them. The men didn't have any of that. In fact, according to the Midrash, they were given birds in order to give a, a musical sound to, to their words. But both groups, when they came through the water, the one thing was they had what I would call that prophetic vision of above. They were no longer at this level, but they had risen to the level above. All the Jews are singing the song at the same time. You tell me how everybody could know every word of a song sung for the very first time. This is what was going on. These people had actually received a tremendous vision that was above and beyond anything that we can ever possibly imagine. It's like us going to a, a, a place and all of a sudden we've got this amazing feeling insight that we didn't have before that's exactly what will happen to the jews when they come out of the water they will have an insight that is beyond anything parable come oh, excuse me come parable the understanding is they can now sing a song that they couldn't sing before they went into the water in fact you remember before they go into the water the group was split four different ways some wanted to go back why did you bring us out here? Some wanted to just sit and pray. Another group, they, they simply said, let's challenge them. Let's go after the Egyptians. Let's go to war. And another group says, I, I don't know what to do. I'm just too confused to, to even move. So there was lots of things going on. But after they all went through the sea, all of a sudden, they're now all singing in unison. Something had changed. And that something was a vision that they got from God that we have no understanding of, but all we have are their words. Now, according to the rabbis, the words that we find for Moses's song are the words that help us understand the resurrection. Now, I haven't been able to, to dissect that yet, but I know that eventually God is going to let me get there. So I'm just now just beginning to get to the understanding. I'm trying to move from this lower level of intellect to the upper level of intellect, the intellect that's found in the superconscious. You know, we all have th thoughts, bright ideas. That comes from Hawkwa. That comes from wisdom. And then we take that same thought and we e expand it. Then it becomes bina. And this, this expanded idea is what we really are looking for. We want to, to get beyond the minimum of the words. That's why we gather together to, to, to go through this, to talk about it. That's where we're going. You know, water is also not only about the Torah. Water is also about repentance. According to, again, back to Genesis chapter one, there was a divine spirit moving over the water. In the understanding of the rabbis, that divine spirit was the Mashiach. The Mashiach is moving over the waters because he is about to bring redemption, restitution of all of us. And so that's a forelooking at this particular point in time. So there's this idea of repentance. But even in repentance, there's really two sides to it. There's a side that actually feels joy. In other words, they are so excited, they become joyful about repentance. But see, they, they were close to God and they find themselves even closer. But there's also the group that has awe or fear of God. Now, fear of God is, is, is acceptable, but the understanding of fear is the idea, the fact that you find yourself so far away that you're not sure the difference between joy and fear, surety. And that's where we all are attempting to go to the point of drawing so close, we're assured. We feel that calmness. We feel that joy that, that comes from understanding and knowing things that we didn't know before. That's the, the idea behind it. Also, 
the word for the idea of water is is the fact that it speaks of God because he is the source of all living water. Three different ways then that we can look at water and see a metaphor. It's a metaphor of God, it's a metaphor of, 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 of repentance, and it's a metaphor of who God is. All three of those function all the time. So I find myself when they began to lift Joseph out of the water, and remember, Moses spoke to the water, and as he spoke to the water, the trunk rose up. That's how he was able to get it out. And then they took it from the water and they could go on. So the idea of the water there was a resurrection of what was going on. Back to that Genesis chapter one, verse three. As we go through this idea, or this, these understandings, the, the idea of the splitting of the sea is important and significant. Now, let's go back again because I wanna get a little bit more to this. Now I told you that there, the idea of, of uh, the people, I believe were the uh, multitude of Gentiles and the Arev Rav. Now I don't put the Arev Rav and the, and the Gentiles together. And the reason is because the Rev Rav supposedly were the combination of those souls that had been lost from the days of Adam, from the Tower of Babel, from the, the, the flood. All of those are skeletal souls, I guess I would want to call them. But they all had the same thing. We, they all went with Moshe. Now, the word Ha'am happens to be, have a value. It, the value of the word is 145. Now, he spoke it three times, the, the people. Three times 145, 335. That's Moses' name in Gematria. So Moses, remember, he wanted to bring the Arev Rav out. He wanted to make those souls living. And so he took them, even though God didn't think he should but he brought them anyway and he's going to pay the price because they're going to be part of those that group that is going to uh, create the golden calf but again he they will come out of the water and on the trip to Mara they will learn the laws of the ashes of the red heifer God from the very beginning has always built a plan there is nothing that has not gotten gone on in this earth that has not passed through his hands. He knows the beginning from the end. And so therefore he has planned all of the ways, all of the strategies, all the things that will be necessary for you and for I. Because each of us has different problems that we're going to go through, but God will have already made the plan and will have already provided the cure. That becomes very obvious as you go through and, and you begin to learn deeper and deeper into the story. So they are now going north to turn around to come south. At the same time, we know that the Egyptian uh, court has gone in to tell Pharaoh they're not coming back, which causes Pharaoh to organize his soldiers and they begin to to ride their 600 chariots up north. Their blitzkrieg is about to start. You see, Pharaoh's army was probably the most sophisticated army in the world at that time because of those chariots and the use of the horses. Egyptians were famous for their horses back in those days. Solomon's, when he married his first wife, who was the Egyptian princess, received hundreds of horses. And so he had to build three stables in order to house them all. There's one stable that was at Megiddo. Another stable was at Jerusalem. And the third one was down south. And I think it was at Tel Tamar, down to the south part. That's where I think it was. There is no complete answer. 
but we know that he'd had them north and south. And the reason he had them at the north and the south end is because he co collected taxes as the people passed through his country. They had toll roads way back then. And so he was constantly using his soldiers and his horses in a lot of different ways. Okay, so now he knows that they're escaping. I want you to look at 419, 1419 for a second. Pharaoh is beginning the process of attacking. Now, the, the people had just come to the sea and they were now camped. And it says in verse 19, the angel of God who had been going in front of the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud, the pillar of darkness, moved from the front of, the, of them and went behind them. And it came between the camp of, the, of Egypt and the camp of Israel. And there were clouds and darkness. Now, according to the Midrashic writings, it was more than just darkness. They had to deal with rain, pelting torrential rain. They also had to deal with hailstones. They had to deal with thunder, which was scaring the animals, the horses. All of this was going on behind them. But where the children of Israel were was daylight. None of, the pay, none of that was affecting them. In fact, they didn't hear the thunder. They didn't hear any of that. But we know in the darkness of a, of a thunderstorm how, um, what's, what's the word I'm searching for? How it, it impacts us. I was sitting on my son's porch a couple of years ago out back. And, you know, they had predicted rain and everything. Well, while I was sitting there on the porch, lightning struck no more than 100 feet away. Can you imagine the sound of lightning or thunder caused by that lightning striking that tree that's less than 100 feet away? I think I jumped real good and I'm old, but I think I was higher than my son, who's much younger. So obviously I was still spry, but no, that's, that's beside the point. The point is, is that there was a lot of things going on to the Egyptians who were now coming after him. It's as though God had put a hook in Pharaoh's mouth and dragged him out there. The same idea will happen again at the Battle of Gog and Magog. God will hook the jaw of Gog and drag him to a battle that he really doesn't want to be in. But he finds himself there anyway. Now, this 19, when it talks about the darkness, remind yourself, this is the seventh day of darkness. Because remember, during the plague of darkness, we had two three-day periods. And every plague lasted seven days. So the Jewish understanding is this is the seventh day of that plague, which gives the Jews enough time to begin to cross the water. So let's go back to the, to the text and notice what happens. So again, go back to verse number 19. So the angel of God who had been going in front of the, of the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud moved from in front of them and went behind them. And it came between the camp of Egypt and the camp of Israel. And there were clouds and darkness. And while it illuminated the night, and one did not draw near to the other all night, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and Hashem moved the sea with a strong east wind all that night. And he turned the sea to damp land and the waters split one more verse the children of israel came within the sea then is a word that's missing on dry land and the water was a wall for them okay this is i want us to see what's what's going on here because first off the red sea Sea of Reeds, doesn't matter, goes from south to north. The wind is coming from the east. How does an easterly wind 
wall up water on a north and a south. Then we go back to the question. It doesn't seem to work. But we also have to understand, remember when the plagues were happening, the grasshoppers blew in from the east. East is also a description of uh, a judgment. And so there was a judgment that was actually blowing in that night. Now, as we go to the next pages, I want you to look at a couple of things. I want you to go to verse 29. The children of Israel went on dry land in into the midst of the sea. The preposition's not quite right. It should be into. The waters was walled for them on the right and on the left. Now, I want you to go to chapter 15, and I want you to go to verse 19 again. Okay. Now, Pharaoh's cavalry came with his chariots and horsemen into the sea, and Hashem turned back the waters upon them. The children of Israel walked on the dry land into the sea. Why does he use the same expression three times? We know that the first time from all the Midrashic writings, it tells us that when the first people went into the water, the water was up to their nose. Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, the sea wasn't dry. It only dried when and after they began to enter the water. Now we're told in one Midrash that Nachshon, a, a Judite, was the first one into the water and he'll be seen later again in, num in the book of Numbers. He'll be the first one to bring an offering. But I want you to understand, he really wasn't the first one into the water. He was pretty ticked off because right next to him was a Benjamite who actually did jump into the water ahead of him. And he says, that won't happen. So he jumped into the water and both of them create a path. Now, as they create this path, everybody else, as they begin to jump in and they jumped in by clans, by tribes. Now it doesn't tell, I haven't found a Midrash that tells me how the Gentiles did it or the Arev Rav, but we know that there were paths for each of the clans. And so each of the clans went into the water. They went into the water, the land dried as they went into the water. As the land is drying as they're going into the water, the land is also sprouting trees, fruit trees. Well, why would it sprout fruit trees? And what is this all about? Well, the concept was, as they moved out into the water, the children got hungry. How do you satisfy a hungry kid on a trip, a road trip? Well, you could throw a cracker in the back seat of the car so that they have something to eat while you're going along or pass out a juice box. Well, they, they didn't have juice boxes and they didn't have cracker boxes. So what they did was they grabbed the fruit off the trees. Where do we see a picture of trees along the water that actually are producing healing. Oh, that's Ezekiel. Same kind of idea. So we have the Jews passing through the water like firmament, dividing the waters from the right and from the left. And they'd walk out into the water. And then all of a sudden they take from dry land into the midst of the sea again. They turned. And then again, it says they walked into the waters, then all of a sudden they walked from dry land into the water and they turned again. You see, the Jews never crossed the sea that day. They went in, around, and out. And they stood on the same bank where Moses never left. Moses was there the whole time. Now the Pharaoh and his army, Pharaoh didn't go in, but his whole army did. And they didn't want to go in. It says that the chariots dragged the horses into the water. How can an inanimate object, a piece of wood, and we'll find about wood later, a piece of wood causes them to drag the horses in and they all drown. 
And not only do they drown, but they float to the surface after they've drowned. Totally miraculous. And so the weapons that they had, they gathered from the Egyptians. All of this went along. Everything was going fine. Now they go through the, the sea and we see the songs that they, they sing after they've gone through the sea. But I want you to go to the second body of water. Israel has gone three days in, into the sea, into the land, into the desert, wilderness. Having gone three days, they say they have no water. Now they won't go much farther and they'll say they don't have any food. So that's when God creates the manna. But there's a midrash that says when the Jews left the land of Egypt, that they had 61 days of matzah. In other words, they did have food. Matzah was the food that had been sustaining them while they were slaves in Egypt. Matzah was a providing enough nourishment that they could continue, but let's get to the water first. We understand that they arrived at the water. And when they arrived at the water, they found that the water was bitter. Now, I remember reading a book by Jamie Buckingham called Where Eagles Soar, in which he talked about the water being bitter. He indicated that that bitter water, had they al allowed themselves to drink it, actually would have killed the parasites that they had picked up while they were in Egypt, that that's what it would have taken care of. Well, I don't know if that's true, but the bitter water does give me something else to think about, because what they do is they take a tree, ets, and they throw it into the water. Well, the, the concept of, of ets, There's a word that has a similar sound, similar meaning. Well, not a similar meaning, but a similar sound called eights. Same letters, different vowels. Eights is the idea of comfort. So they throw a tree into the water and they're provided with comfort. What kind of tree provides you with comfort? Well, there were two trees that were identified one was the oleander, and that's, that's poison. Doesn't matter what part of it you touch it's, or eat, that's poison. The other one was an olive tree, but an olive tree is bitter also. So the concept was homeopathically that like cures like. If you get a flu shot, you are getting a weakened virus of flu in order to heal you or cure you, or keep you from receiving a flu. That same thing happened with the tree. The tree provided them with all that they needed to heal the water. Again, when we begin to look at Torah, when we begin to study the Torah, we have intellectual knowledge, scientific understanding, that's the lower form. But what we're looking for is to go beyond that to what is above. And God oftentimes tells us that we're going to have to take this medicine in order to gain that ground that we need. So as we go through studying the Torah over and over again, we find ourselves learning a lot. I want to talk for a second, go back for a second. I want to go back to the word for Hayom. Hayom is the word for sea. Remember, they crossed the, the sea, Yom Sof. Now, Yom Sof isn't the Sea of Reeds. Yom Sof is actually what's called the Great Sea. Because the idea of, of Sof is, 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 is large, big. Now, how did that sea get there? Midrashically, we're told that when Enosh, remember Enosh, he's the third generation away from Adam. They had a flood during those days. And that flood during those days caused what we now see is the canyon between 
the Middle East and Africa. That's that sea, that canal, all of that is actually caused by the first flood, the flood of Enosh. And so that's why it's referred to as this as the big sea. Now, if you take the value of, of the children of Israel entered the waters on dry land, that whole phrase, you have a value of 1,430. 1,430 is 55 times 26. Who is 26? 26 is him. What's 55? 55 is the value of the word for C, and 55 is the value of the word hakal, all, all. So as they cross the sea, all of them crossed that sea, or actually went in and came back out. Later, they'll cross the sea at an entirely different place. Eights talks about comfort. Eights also talks about advice. The idea of advice that goes along with studying the Torah. We have to take the advice of the Jewish rabbis. We have to take the advice of the Midrash, of the Talmud, of Sohar. All of those things help us to become better than we were before we started. I'm tired. That's enough for a while. You, you get the idea. Next time I can talk about the man and I can talk about Rephaim and I can talk about all of those other things. There's so this chapter, these chapters, three of them are loaded. You, you could spend days just on those chapters studying and learning. I did. But anyway, you have any questions or any ideas or thinking out loud? I have. Go, Go ahead. Do we know who carried the essence of Joseph? Do we know who did? Yes. Um, it was assigned to, the, to uh, Joseph's sons, Ephraim. Ephraim's sons mm -hmm. carried him out. Now, there's another story that says that not only was he taken out, but all 12 of the brothers. In other words, each tribe carried, Judah carried Judah out, um, Asher, all of them were carried out by their family, taken back to the land and buried in the land where their tribes were given possession. I, I haven't followed that one very far to, to know if that's true or not but that's, that's what they have said. So anyway, for what it's worth. Questions, comments? Talk to me. One of the things that you did mention, and I've noticed this too, uh, you, you found to fill in the firstborn, the ashes, Shabbat, a lot of this was all before Sinai. A lot of teaching was going on. And a lot of people miss that. <laughs> but it's all just plainly right there. Uh, and essentially, there's an awful lot of what we think was post-Sinai actually going on pre-Sinai. Yeah. And, and we, we also, again, that stimulates another thought. We also understand that, that, you know, just as the weapons, that's a simple concept, that they left the land without weapons, but they had weapons, according to this, before they drown. It, it's not in chronological order. And again, there was another portion that does the same thing to me. And that's in, the, the book, in uh, chapter 16, when we talk about manna. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time there, but if you look at verse number 33, Moses said to Aaron, take one jar and put a full omer of manna into it and place it before Hashem in this for a safekeeping for your generations. As Hashem has commanded Moses, Aaron placed it before the Ark of Testimony. There was no Ark of Testimony then. Exactly. In other words, we can't, we can't say 
for example, that there's a chrono chronology is correct in this. Now they may have run out of water three days out, but it, it they, but yet at the same time, Mara is there. But some people said that Mara was, was 60 days journey away. So chronology doesn't always work. What we're looking for are the aspects. What is it that, that they want us to understand as much as anything else? So I, I've learned to spend less time worrying about the chronology and more time trying to figure out how the facts fit the situation. What is it I'm supposed to learn from that? I, th I found that fascinating. And again, I, didn't, I did not learn this idea of the man in the jars until I studied this year. I've, how many times do you pass over it? And then all of a sudden, there it is. It's been there. Obviously, he wrote this book before I bought it. And so therefore, I, I, you know what I'm saying. Anyway, that's yeah. all I got for that. I had the idea in my head that when they went into the sea, they came out above where they had been, but it makes more sense that they came out where they started. Otherwise, how would they collect the weapons? I, some of these yeah. things just blow my mind. And we have to understand Pharaoh's army got into the water just like the Jews did. They followed the same path that the Jews were following. And then all of a sudden, their Swish. wheels began to get stuck. And what happens? We find a 600 chariots drown. Now we know from, the out, from this story, Pharaoh will return to, to Memphis, back to his city. And after returning to that city, they're going to be attacked and he has no army to protect the people. They will spend the next 200 years in slavery to a nation that is from the west of them. Yeah, to the west of them. 200 years. Wait a second. How long did Israel spend 210 years? Hmm. Measure for measure. Okay. That's a side note. Anything else for the good of the company? There was something, but it temporarily slipped gears. I, oh, the manna. Yes. Yep. You said that it uh, was a 60 day affair. They had the, they had matzah. Matzah, right that would have lasted them 61 days now. Oh, matzah, okay. So if they had the matzah that would last 61 days, why were they hungry? In other words, they had been living for years off the simplest of the, of the breads. Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, their appetite has changed, and now they've got to have they've got to have quail. They've got to have all of these other things. Um, yeah, I'm just curious. Where did you find that 60 day? Ginsburg. Ginsburg. Yep, Rav Ginsburg. He's terrible. He teaches me too many things. In fact, I went and bought another one of his books. Don't buy this book unless you're into math because he's talking about the number called 137. 137 is a scientific word that deals with quantum physics. He takes the same number 137 and everywhere you look in the, in the book of Genesis and beyond, the number 137 is a common number. In other words, science and Kabbalah, science and Torah, match and there will come a day when there won't be that separation between left and right up and down yeah it'll be one well what's what's interesting that's the first time i've seen the 137 or heard of it if you do the single digit of numbers like harav ginsburg says what do you come up with two 
the world of Asiya. Bet. Uh, and he goes through a whole four pages dealing with just the that simple idea of the the concept of family, the concept of marriage. Remember Adam when he came down, he and Eve were together. But remember how they were back to back, so neither could see the other, neither could understand what the other one was saying. But yet, then when he took them apart, they now began to be of one flesh they were two they were one they became two and then they married and became one again concepts of there's a whole it, it's amazing what god has put into this man's mind i could never possibly learn half of it first off he's a physicist he's also a, the, a theologian he's got several doctorates he's my age he's my age with all these doctorates and lo and behold his work he i don't know how many books he's written but they're all useful but now he's getting to the point where he's having very difficult times talking speaking his voice is slowly deteriorating but his mind is sharp very sharp. In fact, it was uh, uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe that convinced him he should start taking his books. And, and remember, Rebbe died several decades ago, 90s, right? And he told him, the world needs for you to write down what you know. Mm -hmm. I've got nine books on my shelf and soon to have 10 of things that he knew and that he wrote about. And obviously this book is real brief. It's only 396 pages oh. only. I have been two weeks in the first chapter. <laughs> and so I'm not good. stupid, <laughs> but I, He's, He's gotten so many 137s in this in those in that first chapter that it's just taken me a long time to even begin. You know, I, sometime if I didn't have time, if I had time, I would love to tell you how the first three verses of this explains God's utterances, speech, and actions. Remember the hey? Mm-hmm. All right, let me give you a simple understanding. Hey, hey is five, right? But it comes in three parts, right? The letter comes in three parts. The top is thought, side is speech, speech and the open area is action. Yeah. Go back to the first three verses and count the number of times he talks about light, he talks about water, he talks about firmament. You'll find out it's five. What he does with that, those three ideas is, oh, it's not incomprehensible because I've comprehended some of it, but it's the idea that the Torah and especially Genesis chapter one is not what I thought it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago. It is an entirely new understanding of God and where we're going in life, what's happening. And it's all in the numbers. It's all in the math. Science is into quantum physics now. Quantum physics struggles with the idea because quantum physics has a number called 137 that it can't figure out. And yet here, if they would just simply take the Bible the first chapter, they would find all of the similarities and parallels, and they would begin to make new theories and new understandings based on just simply how the Bible works. You know, I, I've, I read a lot, but I don't read enough. And Gerald Schroeder, who most of you know, he's the guy who came up with the theory of, uh, he created the scientific understanding of 15 billion years, how that's possible, how that could all still be, be in seven days, just as he had said, explaining the whole process. 
he and Ginsburg, if they got together, I don't think they could leave each other alone because there is so much they have packed in their minds that would help one another as they went through this. But anyway, that's for another day. So hope you got something out of today. Oh, boy. Yeah, I need another book. <laughs> well, that's what I'm thinking. I don't have enough to read. I know, understand. Well, I, Mary's a bigger house, Steve. You, she got so many books from you. She, she's going to have to move out just so she has room for the books. <laughs> yes, and that's not, all, that's not all of them because I still have books over there. I have about a, well, I've, it's about 120 books here. I was so grateful when uh, Marilyn put a recall on her books. I'm so grateful. <laughs> yep. Life is good, right? Right. So, anyway, so thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you. Shalom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lila Tov. Lila Tov. Lila Tov. I'll fix the recording.